These are uh, <coughs> these are archaeological sites. The archaeologists in the room may recognize some of those locations. Uh, I know many of you won't. This is local. Many of these sites came from right here that I looked at. All right, in this region, you're not far from them. Some of them. This is a, this is Indianapolis. It's a long way away. 800 years ago. It's a long way away. All right. Um, so that's just to orient you where some, where all of these sites are actually. So my first step was to look at stuff, look at ceramics, look at objects, because I'm an archaeologist. This is a uh, particular type of ceramic pot that was made here in the region about 1200 AD. And this particular pot comes from a site called Rivera Vaz in Macomb County. Uh, and it's, the type is known as Macomb Linear. That's the name for the style. So if you're not, if you're not used to looking at arche, uh, archaeological items, um, these designs all have names on the pot. And um, that's how we classify. Then there are, uh, there's another type that I looked at called Macomb Interrupted Linear. This is uh, this particular ceramic came out of the Saginaw Valley. It's a little bit different design. You can see it looks different. Um, there's a third type known as Springwell's Net Impressed. Those who have been down to the Fort Wayne Mound in Detroit, Fort Wayne, uh, that's where this came from. So these were the three main types of ceramics that are associated with Native American communities at this, this point in time, around 1200 AD. And those, that, so the collection of designs, if we classify them, that's what's known as a typology. That typology hasn't changed in 40 some odd years. Nobody had done any work with that typology at all. So people were satisfied just to call that stuff what it's been called this whole time. And it wasn't until I started getting in and looking at the stuff that I realized there's more, there's more to this story here. There, there, you know, these designs are, much, there are more than three different kinds of designs in this, you know, going across these collections. Well, analytically that has consequence. You know, you can either lump or split. Everybody had been lumping. There's value to splitting. And, but I had to figure out how to do I had to come up with my own taxonomy is what it comes down to. Um, so in other words, under the way people were classifying these ceramics, these two would be the same thing. And this is where I refer to it as, I like to think about the Sesame Street song, one of these things is not like the other, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's not the same kind of pot, but in the, in, the, in the literature, that would be classified as the same kind of thing. And the most obvious would be, for, you see this design element here that interrupts these lines? That's a very, that, that's a significant thing for someone to put on a pot, all right? There's a message being sent there. People are com communicating things. And if you call this, this, you can't tease that out. So I had to invent a new way to classify this stuff, so I did. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to subject you to all the photos of all the stuff, even though I'd love to look at the stuff. Uh, this is an example of the difference of resolution between the way that things used to be classified and the way that things are classified now under my tax line. That's a whole different level of resolution. All right, that's a whole, just the colors will tell you. Those are the same, er these represent areas. So Saginaw Valley, Southeast Michigan, Southern Ontario, Central Indiana, you go from that many kinds of things to that many kinds of things. So it's a much more fine-grained level of detail. Then what I did was, those maps that you saw um, that I produced and showed you where the site locations were, those sites were uh, entered into a geographic information system. So a computer program that allows, think about a really scientifically precise Google Earth, all right? It allows down to the sub-meter level of accuracy uh, to tell where something came from. I uh, put all that data into a GIS, we'll call that GIS for short from now on. And then I did regression analysis 
uh, and looked at the relationship between the locations and the styles on the ground. The thought is here, if you think about a collection of sites, the closer two sites are, the more similar the stuff that comes from them is going to be, right? You would think that would be the expectation. So I dumped, I dumped my points into GIS, I did some different treatments, and I looked at the relationships between similarity, stylistic similarity of the pots to the distance apart. Now, it's important to re remember that all these distances are, are calculated using Euclidean distance, which is straight line distance. And we know that people don't really move that way, but we're talking at a scale at the time that I did this analysis that I couldn't incorporate accurate, topologically correct models in my analysis. So straight line, I didn't have the computer power, I'm sorry. So that's all I could do. Um, and I, so um, that site similarity, how similar two sites are, um, the measure associated with that is what's known as a Brainerd Robinson coefficient that goes from zero to 200. And I looked at uh, the relationship between distance and that, that, that site similarity reading, Brainerd Robinson coefficient. And again, you would think the closer the two sites are, you know, the more likely the stuff is to be like each other. And that's what I found. So for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with a, a figure like this, essentially the relationship between similarity and distance is less than 3%. That's problematic, right? How do you explain it? Um, so I had to start asking another series of questions. If distance doesn't account for the distribution of stuff across the study area, then what does? Uh, let me explain this slice on the line. What you see here, the red lines, connect sites that are within the 90th percentile of similarity to one another. One another. Now this isn't this isn't surprising here. These sites are right in with one another. You would expect those to be more similar than different. But how do you explain? Sites outside of Indianapolis, modern day Indianapolis, and, and sites in the Saginaw Valley, how do you explain that kind of similarity? If distance doesn't explain it, what's going on? I had to come up with a way to explain that. That totally, I did not expect that. Um, so in order to move from a static set of artifacts and metrics associated with those artifacts to a dynamic social process, I needed some help. And that's where, the con that's where the computer simulation comes in. So enter the agent-based model. I created this model uh, in a package known as NetLogo to those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, simulation or modeling, and, and I use them interchangeably. Um, I created a model that, that basically created communities and put people in these communities. And each one of these communities uh, has its own particular home style. So if you grow up here, you've got that, that's your style. And when, this, when the simulation is initiated, everybody's got their home style. And then what I wanted to do was find out what happens when people move around and start trading styles. You know, what does it take for there to be a bunch of assorted styles and all of a sudden people decide this is what we're doing? What's the social context? How do people have to come together? Um, and these models correspond to what we see in the anthropological literature, the archaeological literature, uh, regarding trade and exchange. And what I was looking at was the rate at which people leave their home community, go to a new community, and that style is picked up by that other community. So how likely is it that someone will leave their home community, go to a distant destination and introduce new stock. Right. And you can measure that uh, through the diff diffusion of innovations literature. Um, the rate at which that, that happens forms a curve. And depending on how that happens, you either get uh, a few people adopt it, adopting a new idea, and then a lot of people 
adopting it so you get a much more rapid adoption and it levels off to a point of saturation. That's what's known as an S-curve. And then you get um, and, uh, and, and much more rapid adoption, you'll get what's called an R-curve, which stuff just takes off and, and goes. All right. um, this is well documented in the diffusion literature, and uh, that's what I was paying attention to in my model. In addition to the, the number of different styles present, you know, pre present in the simulation as a whole. So what did I find? I, well, after about 700 computer hours and uh, I think over a million exchange scenarios, which involve varying uh, nearest neighbor exchange or people moving from one community to the nearest community, or random exchange, people could pick any other community to move around to, or um, an aggregated exchange scenario. I looked at what happened both with the adoption rates and, and the, the number of styles in my simulation. And, and part of what I was doing was, uh, does my model conform to what we would expect in the diffusion of innovations literature? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, and we can tell that by the type of adoption curve, the R curves or the S curves that I showed you before. Um, so basically what this does is, by comparing S curves and R curves in relation to the destination where people are going to trade styles, I validated that my model is behaving in accordance with the literature. And that's important to do, because otherwise you don't know if your model is grounded in reality. So there's, once you construct your model, you have to make sure it's behaving properly. There's a book called Models Behaving Badly that um, <laughs> just because you made a model doesn't mean it's worth anything. And so you have to go through a process to make sure that you can do that. You can make claims. Mine conform to what I would expect. Uh, so when I think about how people get together, and, and, and you know, you can think about it as you know, what you do on any Friday night or, you know, okay. um, you know, the question is, what does it take for people to decide on a new style? This is what we're all doing. This is what we're doing. Um, when we get to this point in time in prehistory, these styles start changing very rapidly, every couple hundred years or so. That's a new phenomenon when we get to this period of time. Prior to that, you know, styles are in place for 500, 1,000 years at any one time. And then we, when we get to this point, these, st these styles, these ceramic styles, start changing over every couple of hundred years. So something's different social. Something's different. Spatial, I, don't, I didn't know what it was, but I decided to find out. So I, at first I explored local exchange and its relationship to stylistic diversity, or people going from their home community to the nearest neighboring community. And after I came out with my scenario, all my trial runs for that, you know, essentially what you see is people trade stuff around, but there's really no difference in people settling on a common theme. And then I decided to look at a scenario that would uh, simulate regional exchange, so that whole area that you saw, you saw with the, from Indianapolis up to Saginaw Valley and over to here. What happens when you get people just selecting random destinations across that whole area, going from one community to another, int maybe introducing a new style, maybe it takes off, maybe it doesn't. Um, there's really not much of a change. I mean, essentially what you get is reshuffling the deck in these scenarios. All right? So we know at this point in time, people are engaging each other in a wide geogra at a wide geographic range, and they're settling on common styles that change over every couple of hundred years over a huge distance. How does that happen? People, what's different? It's not taking 500 or 1,000 years anymore. Well, the one scenario that I explore that results in uh, not just reshuffling in the deck, but people adopting you know, standardized styles is in 